welcome back to Planet Sail and welcome to episode six of On Course, our regular look at the sailing world. Now, yes, I know this isn't sailing, but there's a strong similarity between what goes on up in the air and what's happening aboard some of the most advanced boats in our sport. Now, cross-country gliding happens to be my other passion aside from sailing. And it's starting to become pretty clear that the two sports are getting closer and closer. But before we get stuck into the detail, here's what's in episode six. We take a look at the world's largest lake race and talk to the man who's won it seven times and won the America's Cup twice, Ernesto Bertarelli. I go boat spotting with an offshore celebrity, Mike Golding. A little bit more volume up the front again. Yeah. But, uh... but this, do you know, now here's, here's, a here's a testing question for a bonus point. Go do on, you know man. which mark model this is? Oh my God. Ah, I see. No. Here's <laughs> <laughs> the answer. Plus, we find out what's going on in the scene with Doc Talk. But first, it's time to talk water and wings. Is, is that modern high-performance sailing machines like the America's Cup boats, Sail GP boats, they're all sailing at speeds at sort of 40 or 50 knots and they're getting very very close indeed to this territory. We're cruising along here at uh, 75 knots, I'll just show you that. And that's a sort of medium quick pace we can slow right down to 45 knots which is well inside the sailing territory so it's really not that surprising that actually a lot of the sailors of these high performance machines are starting to look to flying for some of the answers and that includes both the technical side with the wing sections the flaps the transition phases between different wing configurations and indeed the way that you handle them. Never has high performance sailing been quite so close to flying. In the America's Cup world, it starts with the sail itself. On the previous generation AC45 Cats, it was a solid wing. Now aboard the AC75s, it's a twin skinned soft sail that forms a wing section. Dan Bernasconi, who was one of the key architects of the new America's Cup class, explains. A sail is effectively a wing that stands vertically. So instead of just a single mainsail that a conventional yacht has, we've got a twin or double skinned mainsail, which gives a really efficient aerodynamic section. If you took a cut through that, it would look like a D section at the front with the two skins coming off, much the same as an aircraft wing. On the other side of the equation are the hydrofoils. Aboard cup boats, they're sophisticated foils that can be raised or lowered in and out of the water. Under the glass rules, only one foil is allowed to be in the water other than during manoeuvres. 
The canting system is similar in concept to that used on the Amoka 60 boats. A battery-powered hydraulic power unit drives the rams that raise and lower the foiling arm. The arms are supplied items common to all four teams, but the wings on the end are designed by the teams, and it's here where some of the key development work is taking place. Foils could well be the area which decides the next America's Cup. The principles which allow an AC-75 yacht to foil are, are basically the same principles that allows an aeroplane to stay in the air. So we've got an airfoil section um, on the foils, which is uh, roughly the same cross-sectional shape as an aircraft wing. And the flow over the top of those foils is, is faster than the flow underneath due to the, the geometry of the section shape. That creates more pressure underneath, which lifts the, the seven and a half tons of the, the yacht and her crew. Unlike the previous AC-45 foils and indeed the rules governing the Amoka 60s, the new cup boats are allowed trailing edge flaps that can vary the amount of lift and drag that the foils develop. So for the foils we decided to allow flaps uh, on their trailing edges which are much the same as ailerons or, or flaps on a aircraft which uh, can rotate to control the amount of lift but ultimately it allows you more precise control of the lift and therefore the ability to fly. But these differences are going to be really hard, if not impossible, to spot. So what can we see and how different are the team's boats? Uh, one of the biggest differences I think we've seen thus far is the differences in, in hull design. That's probably the most largely talked about item um, of the four boats that are out on the water at the moment. Um, every team has taken a slightly different approach to the same problem. So I would say there's on one side um, American Magic and Ineos, they have uh, pretty flat hulls. And then there's Team New Zealand and us, we have uh, these hulls with a hump at the bottom. That shows that uh, we had quite different ideas on how the boats will be sailed. One of the fundamental decisions you've got to make is, is whether the crew are going to transfer from windward to leeward. Uh, through a tack or a jibe. It's a really interesting uh, sort of design trade-off there of, of whether you, you move the crew or keep them fixed. We'll find out who, who's got it right and who's got it wrong. So what's been going on with the teams? The British team in EOS UK have been pretty shy this summer. They've been training in the Solent, but we've seen very little of them. Their first boat is being stripped down, ready to be shipped to New Zealand, while the second boat has been moved from the builders in Southampton to here, behind these doors, to be fitted out. And they're not very keen for anyone to see it, yet. After making a punchy call to ship their boat during the COVID crisis, American Magic are now in New Zealand and sailing. And while it might be winter down there, they're clocking up the hours on the water and finding out what the America's Cup race course feels like. It must be odd for their helmsman Dean Barker though. One of the most famous New Zealand sailors, he's returned home with an American team with the goal to take the America's Cup away. It's, um, yeah, it, it, it does feel strange, you know, uh, you know coming back to New Zealand. Um, representing a foreign team but at the same time you know I've, uh, it's been a fantastic opportunity um, for me personally to be able to be involved in a, uh, a challenge representing the New York Yacht Club and, uh, and we've got three fantastic principals that are um, that back this campaign and so you know, we'd obviously be um, the, the goal for this team is to, to be successful here in Auckland and so um, you know, we're going to do whatever we can to, to win the America's Cup. We know very little about Luna Rossa, who are playing their cards very close to their chests. And then there's the defenders, Emirates Team New Zealand, who continue to scorch around their home patch as they prepare to race against the other teams for the first time. And that first time will happen at the America's Cup World Series in Auckland, which is from the 17th to the 20th of December. Then it's just a few weeks until the 36th America's Cup cycle gets underway. And by then, teams will be fully committed to the boats they designed and developed in isolation. So when they meet for the first time, not even the crews will know what to expect. Just like the old days.
We all know that over the years, performances have increased. But did you know that in around the world racing, average speeds have increased by 30% over the last 20 years, and peak speeds around 50%. And all the while, the boats have got lighter. Of course, the two are linked. But the reality of increasing performance while reducing the amount of structure to carry new loads is a huge task for engineers. The build-up to the next Vendée Globe, which starts this November, has seen some big advances in this field, but it's taken an enormous amount of effort behind the scenes. Composite engineers Gurit has spent more than 6,000 hours on various Imoca 60 projects that they've been involved with since the last Vendée Globe and the results are spectacular. As well as working closely with Chiral, who were the first team to show what the new generation of Imoca 60s could do, for the next Vondi Globe, seven of the eight new 60s will be using Gurit materials, while the company's engineers have been working with 12 teams. So while the leap in performance has already been spectacular to see, the work behind the scenes has been intense. The cost of running a boat is always a touchy subject, no matter what the size. But this year, with so little sailing, the one calculation you don't want to do is dividing the number of days you spent on the race course by the overall cost. So we won't. But superyacht skipper Mike Atkinson, round the world sailor Luke Malloy, and logistics expert Tom Sell have set up a new company to help owners address the cost issues around their campaigns. Based at the heart of the Mediterranean scene in Palma, Mallorca, here it's not uncommon for boats sitting ashore to be costing 50,000 euros a month to go nowhere. So race yacht management are offering services that they say could halve the current running costs for the boats that are parked up. It's an interesting idea backed up by some serious experience in the team. And it's food for thought for these challenging times. At the top of the show, I mentioned how speeds on the water are beginning to match those in the air. But it's not just extreme sailing machines that are raising the speed bar. In July this year, Antoine Albo set a new one mile record on a windsurfer of 43.04 knots. The kite surfing took a step up too, with Sylvain Hosini hitting 39.11 knots over the same distance on a kite surfer. Oh, one last thing, just in case you were wondering how fast this Nimbus 3DT goes. 148 knots. Yep, 148 knots. That'll do it. It's a race with a big reputation and a split personality as famous for its light weather as it is infamous for being one of survival when the conditions let rip. The Boldor Mirabeau is the biggest lake race in the world, attracting over 500 boats that start on a single gun. It's also well known for its extraordinary range of boats, from monohulls to multi-hulls, classic to cutting edge, along with the extraordinary Libera class. For many of the 3,000 crew that take part, the 66 nautical mile race to Le Bouveret at the eastern end of the lake and back is an overnight race where stealth, patience and a sense of humour are essential. But above all else, it's known for being a very hard race to win and draws people back again and again. Two-time America's Cup winner Ernesto Bertarelli lives on the edge of the lake and rarely misses a race. How many times I've done the boulder? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> maybe too many times. How many times? 25 times. 25 times. Yeah, that's a lot. The boulder is a great race. It's a small, long race, if you see what I mean. You have all the elements of a kind of a long race where you know, funny enough, the start is important just as much on a Olympic course, you know, you got to start well. Then often you have uh, those races that are won from the front, those races which are won from the back. You never know what you're going to get. 
boat speed and tactics are less important as strategy and uh, boat positioning. So it's a, it's a different way of sailing and uh, you got to be fast all the time, of course, to be in the right place when the moment comes. So it's, it's, it's a different game. It's a fun game. It's very competitive. And uh, I, I like it because I also love this place. I love the lake and uh, what better way than to absorb everything that happens on the lake than race for a whole day on it and uh, try to make the best out of it. The early days people were going with those sort of myth that uh, you gotta be here when that happens, you gotta be there when that happens make these big calls ahead of time strategy we're gonna go the French side the Swiss side but now it's more about let's make sure we're in front let's make sure we don't miss an opportunity and when you're in front you try to kind of close the, the opportunity for the other guy so it's a much closer racing than it used to be how many times have you won it I, I won it seven times yeah um, I'm very lucky to be one of the few people who won it three times in five years, which gives you the honor to keep the ball door. I think there's been only three given in history, and I'm the last one who won it and kept it. I mean, that's an awful lot of races and a lot of wins. Is there one that really stands out for you? The, the nice races are the ones that uh, are usually won with wind because they're quick, they're exciting, but I, I have to say the ball though, what strikes you also is those you didn't win, those you failed to win, those where you broke your boat, for example. In the early days, we had a huge storm uh, uh, at the bottom of the lake, we broke our boat. Those who are lost by a second. Um, so, you know, win or lose, there is always a story to every single one of them, and there's not one which is uh, like the other. I was looking through some of the, some of your races and there's one that stood out for me where you, in the very early days, I think it might even have been the first multi hull one where you capsized. Yeah, that's, tell us about that. yeah, I, I, I got involved with multi hulls because a friend of mine, Charles Pictet, um, had had enough uh, of uh, sailing, he wanted to sail mono hulls and had this gigantic 40 foot multi hull, uh, quite extreme tough boat, probably has scarier boat I've ever sailed. Um, and that's how I met Pierre-Yves Giron, who I sailed all my life with, really. I was just coming back from university, bought that boat, sailed it for the first year and capsized um, on the last job, um, not too far from the finish line. Uh, we were third then and we all hopes were gone until the tactician screamed, don't take any help, we're crossing the line. Uh, and we realized we were drifting and we drifted across the line until just a few meters after the line, the mast touched, the bottom broke. And um, that's when we decided to build our own boat. And that's how the Alinghi story really started. Oh, is it? Uh... Yeah. Because st the very first one you did, you did in the monohull, didn't you? you did in the X? Yes, that was more kind of a corporate uh, thing. I um, had been um, called back by my father to work with the company after my um, studies at Harvard. And uh, um, I think it was a way to lure me in the corporation was to uh, get a boat and uh, go sailing. It was not the sort of sailing I do today. It was fun friendly, uh, you know, and very quickly I realized that uh, it's a lot harder with a monohull because it lasts a, long, <laughs> a lot longer. Uh, yeah, I did. I think I did two or three uh, before I sailed uh, before with a, mon with a multi hull. What's the hardest thing about the race? It's after. You usually end up having a headache halfway through the night, don't sleep very well, you're dehydrated. The nice thing about winning is that all that goes away uh, <laughs> if you win. But uh, it's, a, it's a testing uh, race because you, it's a little bit like a marathon. We don't take much uh, food, we don't take much water. If it's long uh, because we want to be light uh, and you don't take much time for yourself. So you usually drive yourself as hard as you can. And so keeping the team together and focus for 
you know, seven, eight, ten, twelve hours, uh, always at the same uh, level of uh, concentration is very hard. What's the secret to success in the, in the bowl door? For me is to know that it's never over. Uh, many, many times the bowl door has been won by people you would have thought were lost in the middle of the lake somewhere that you are not going to see ever again. And um, the reality is that the lake is so tricky, even though you would think it seems small when you come from the ocean, it's very easy to get stuck in one corner and never come out or get stuck, come out and find out that the front of the race has got stuck and then get the benefit of seeing what's going on and being able to go around everybody and win. And that has happened so many times that you can never, never call it. And, and that's what makes it exciting. And in 2019, the excitement came with a huge storm that swept across the lake wreaking havoc. Success for many was simply surviving unscathed. As is so often the case on this lake, when the storm shut down, it did so as if the weather gods had closed a door at the end of the lake. The Boldor Mirabeau is no normal race. After 10 hours and 36 minutes, Lady Cat ghosted across the line to take line honours. Alinghi were third, crossing six minutes behind. But while Ernesto Bertarelli and his crew had not managed to notch up an eighth win, there was still a family victory to celebrate. Lady Cat is owned by Ernesto's sister, Donna Bertarelli. But the end of this race also marked the start of a new era for Alinghi and several of their competitors as they prepared to trade up from their well-used D35 cats to the all-new foiling T35s. In the next episode, we take a close look at this eagerly awaited high-speed foiling machine. When I was a kid, I had this friend and he was fanatical about trains. He had all kinds of books on them. He had books, funny enough, like this. Diesels and electrics in action. Salute to the Southern. And of course, what any self-respecting train buff would have, the Loco Spotters Annual 1971. And the fascinating thing was that he knew all of the locomotives in this book. I mean, he knew this was a Deltic and this was a Peak Class and that was a 37. He knew them all. Now my book was this one, Bristow's Book of Sailing Cruisers, 1973. It was my absolute Bible. It was a list basically of pretty much all of the boats that were in production at that time. Specs, prices, reviews, sail plans. It was fascinating. I spent hours, if not days or weeks, reading this book. And I still do, I still have it. So armed with my trusty Bristow's guide, just in case we need to positively identify something, I decided to go off for a little stroll. Now you might have expected me to start this in the River Hamble. After all, it's one of the most densely populated rivers in the UK for yachts anyway. But I didn't. I came up Southampton Water, I took the right hand fork into the River Itchen, I carried on up the top and I'm here at Shamrock Quay in the heart of the city. So I've come to see the man who runs the show. But Shamrock Quay is an inner city marina or up the River Itchen, uh, just 15 minutes from Ocean Village. So the history uh, and the name really stems from when Camper and Nicholson had the site uh, and they built Shamrock 5, uh, the first of the J-class uh, wooden structures. And there's a bit of competition as to whether she was uh, her keel was done here, a top sizer, or so the fit out was done here, but we like to think that 
she was built here and then transported down to Gosport uh, and they finished her off down there. Um, so hence Shamrock Quay uh, uh, and the building that's behind us at Endeavour Building, that was the original winch houses. So the land that we're sitting on now, this was all a long slipway. Uh, at low water you can still see part of the slipway towards the top end of the yard um, and this has all been reclaimed and the site has been developed into the modern day marina that we've got today. Now as well as coming to Shamrock Quay to see what's around I've invited a special guest, Mike Golding. You might have heard of him, He set a few records in his time and I'm hoping he's a boat spotter as well. Hi. All right, Mike. How, How are you doing? doing? Yeah. We're going to do, do that? that. I guess we can. <laughs> now I'm taking it. You are a boat spotter. Of course. Yeah. Thanks. Who isn't? I mean, <laughs> I've been going around marinas all my life. And, Have uh, you? Yeah. And I'm a big fan. When did you first come down to Southampton? When, when was this sort of part of your scene? Well, I was always back and forward to the area, but uh, really I came down with the challenge, with the original challenge race, the British Steel Challenge, in 1992, 93. Now, what I suggest we do is let's have a little look around the yard first and just see what we can find. OK, All let's right, do that. Let's have a little wander. <laughs> Now look, we've only walked a few <laughs> metres and we've already discovered, we've known each other quite a long time, haven't yeah, we? Of course, we've yeah. just realised that we've grown up in the same area when we were kids. Yeah, I, I can't know. believe that. We're, to Went have... to the same nightclubs. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Probably in the same fights. Probably. <laughs> Mike, I mean, here's an absolute classic, isn't yep. it? This one built just down the road. Yep, Rival 41. And uh, you know, this was a huge boat back in the day. Yeah. Um, and quite a performant one because it had a fin keel. So um, these were seen quite often on the big offshore races. I mean, 83, I remember one of these doing very well in the uh, Zorzenbach race, which was one of them, probably, my, it was my first offshore. Was it? Ocean type event. Yeah, so here's another one. I mean, this is a slightly smaller one, isn't it? It's a 36, I think. It's out of the same template, isn't it? Good boat, good safe boat, but uh, it does tell you how much the game has shifted. Yeah, you know? definitely. Well, let's see what else we can find. What's down the end down here? Oh, Spartan Stevens. Yeah. Now there we're talking. Exactly. And that's a good nick. Yeah, Spartan yeah. Stevens 34, a yeah. really, really popular boat. And yeah, it's been re really refurbished. Yeah, it, it has. Uh, I remember watching um, Edward Heath and the Morning yeah. Clouds, and of course this was his first yeah, Morning yeah, Cloud. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And you look at the boat wow. like that, and he won the Sydney Hobart in this, yeah. in this boat. Well, not this particular one, yeah, but, but in the SNS 34 yeah. in 1969. Yeah. And you look at that and think, it's quite small for the Sydney Hobart. It is small, yeah, it is small. And low freeboard as well, pretty yeah, wet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now this There's is the old, other, old yeah, one, another yeah. classic. Yeah. Needs a bit of a clean, but nonetheless, Contessa yeah. 32, I mean, that's a nice. absolute classic, isn't it? Built yeah. down the road, down at Lymington. Yeah, uh, that could, would polish up. <laughs> well, they affect a fortune. Yeah. I don't know. So what does Bristow say? It says it's a new up-to-date cruiser, modern, without being extreme. She's remarkably safe and easy to handle and has spacious accommodation for six people. I'd agree with most of that, apart from the spacious yeah. accommodation. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> by today's standards, that's not the case. I, I've, I can't get away from the price. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 7,000 pounds, including, including the engine. engine. Oh, good. <laughs> now, here's another one for a local boat, isn't it? Um, yeah. A westerly, I mean, that. I mean, it's unmistakable, isn't it? Any idea what kind of westerly that is? I'm not sure, but as, I mean the Westerly is very similar to the Mac Wester, which we had yeah. as a, a family. It's very similar. It's a very similar style of boat. No, but this, this is bigger, so this has to be a 35. Or? I'm going to look it up because it's bound to be in here. Because in Bristow's book of sailing cruisers, for some reason they absolutely <laughs> loved Westerlies, which were built. Well, up Westerly water were very well. prolific. Many people, including myself, had, had good times on Westerlies. There's loads of them here. Westerly, Westerly Central, Chieftain, Chieftain these Jouster, are all the big ones. Longbow. Longbow. This is what it is. I'm yeah. sure it is. Because oh, you think it's the Longbow? yeah, because okay. it's these two little port light windows here. Okay. Give it away, and it's 31 foot. Right. I think that's right because the Blimey. next, yeah, we got a pageant which was 23 foot. It's not one of those. I, I, I mean, looking at all these older boats, I'm just I'm always constantly surprised by boats that I perceived as being big. Yeah, 
are so small yeah. <laughs> now. Okay, okay, good how condition. Much do you think this costs? Well, I'm, I'm basing it in on 1973. the other boat. Okay, 1973. Including engine. Five and a half thousand. Well, you're not bad. Six and a half. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's another classic yeah. Blue Water Cruiser, isn't it? And yeah. Nick 32, you can't yeah. really get much more classic no. Blue Water Cruiser, can no, you? No, no, no. Here's a testing question for a bonus point. Go Do on, you know Nick. which mark model this is? Oh, my God. Ah, I see. No. Here's <laughs> <laughs> the answer. I only know because I, I cheated a little bit. I did actually have a look. It's a Mark 10. Right. It was the last one that they built, and this one was built in 1979. Oh, okay. But they had a very different, originally they had a very different coach roof, but the hull yeah. and the underwater configuration is exactly the, the same. same. Yeah. Um, which is obviously what made them so popular. Yeah. But I think it's a really, really good pretty boat, boat isn't yeah, it? Yeah, pretty it's, boat. It's quite modern as well, really. Yeah, and they look nice on the water. I mean, when yeah. you see them out sailing, they look like proper boats. I think a few, uh, quite a few of these have done circumnavigation. Right, yeah. Well, a lot of these boats, the boats we've been looking at, are, are go anywhere boats. Well, this is now half the size of the boat that you went round the world in yeah. each time. Yeah. Would you do yeah. it now? I would, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'd do it because it's a great thing to do. And the fact it's going to take you four times as long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, about 200 days, I think, isn't it? Yeah, something yeah, like that's that. a I long think time. 220 days. That is a long time. I mean, I have done 160 one going the wrong way around the world with the challenge yacht, and that's a long time. So you did it with a full crew to start with. Yeah. And then what did you do? Did you just fall out with the crew? Did you decide <laughs> you're not like people and you went off and did it on your own the wrong the, way the, around? The, 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 the brief story of how that came to pass was at the end of the race in Cape Town, uh, the sponsor of the boat, Philip Sorensen, said to me, I'm going to buy the boat, I'm going to do it in the next race, uh, do you want to stay with the programme? And, and I just saw the opportunity of staying, but I also realised there was a big gap. So then my brain started thinking, how can I fill the gap? And then I thought, well, I could try for Chase Record. Then the reason why it was doable um, was because when you train a crew, an amateur crew like, like that, you learn the boat better than mm. you could ever learn a boat. So you knew where everything was, you knew every sequence to every manoeuvre. Because when you're teaching, you're teaching sequences, you, then you, and it's all in sequence. So I imagined the whole process of sailing the boat on my own. And in fact, the truth is, I. I hadn't actually ever been on my own before I left here. <laughs> really? <laughs> I'd always had someone skulking down below or whatever uh, because it was such a rapid turnaround because we got back from the first race and in the winter of that same year I set out again to do it single-handed. You know what comes across so strongly just looking at the boats we've looked at is how strong the British boat building industry was back yeah. in those days and it was all around here wasn't it? Yeah. It's was incredible. Anyway, let's head over to uh, Saxon Wharf just on the other side because I think that paints a rather different picture. Okay. It's a very different yard and I've come to meet Scott Farkerson here who is the marine manager here and indeed um, Ocean Village as well aren't That's you? That's correct. Yeah. Yes. This Saxon Wharf is very different to Shamrock Quay, isn't it? It is. It's quite industrial. We lift a lot of boats. We have a 200-ton hoist, and we also do the leisure industry as well with the with the dry stack offering. So we can do a little bit of everything. And you've got a lot. I see you've got fishing boats. You've got ferries. You've got all kinds of yeah, sort of commercial. It's always exciting. Vessels. Yes, uh, it's never boring. Sometimes we'll have uh, large uh, uh, pleasure craft that are. Uh, 30, 40 meters for taking big parties out. Sometimes it's the silk buster. Sometimes it's a, a, a fishing boat. It's quite interesting. And there are some big names here as well, aren't there? I noticed there's Oyster over in the corner. Yep. Oyster, Princess, Chris Craft, and then various and sundry support industries around it. We have a rig shop here, uh, Rigget. Uh, we have all, all kinds of ocean safety. Ocean safety. A lot of people... Let's not forget ocean yeah. safety. Yes. Yeah. So it's uh, it's quite an offering that we have. Yeah, there. it's a proper commercial. Yeah, uh, yeah, as you can tell from the surroundings, this really is very commercial. Mm. But I suspect for a boat spotter like myself, there's probably still quite a bit to have a look at in the there nooks is, and crannies. There, there is a little secret in that tent that's right over yes, your shoulder. Yes, now I want to go and have a look at that. Tell us a bit about that. What's so, going on there? Well, that's Shamrock 5 and she's having a bit of a refit. She's a J-class boat, as you probably know and everybody will know. And she's uh, rather beautiful, but she's uh, in bits at the moment. Can we go and have a little look inside? Shall we? Excellent. This is my 
third J class, having been captain of Velshida originally for a period of time and then Endeavour. And now I joined Shamrock in 2017. So um, just to explain the work that's going on at the moment, so we're going to actually we've got to take all the cotton out of these seams, which means to be, all that has to be raked out. And then we've got new cotton that has to go in. And that gets spun up into maybe three or four different thicknesses. So wow. and that has to be hammered in all the way along. Very traditional. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's got to go in every single seam, be hammered in. And then on top of that, the teak spline then gets hammered on top of it. Like a wedge. Yeah. Yeah. Wedged in and essentially glued as well. Okay. Yeah, okay. But it's all got to be hammered in by hand. Was she leaking before? Is that why it was taken out originally? Or? She was leaking. Okay. Yeah, okay. a number of leaks. <laughs> but you've only gone down to the water line, you've not gone below it? No, she's actually been very below the Dry. water line. Okay. She's, she's, been, she's in very good condition. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really, I think, what's happened, one of the challenges of a dark painted wooden boat. Yeah. Hot climate down in yeah, the Mediterranean. Okay. Uh, she suffers a lot of expansion and contraction. Yeah. And one of the unique problems of this boat is you've got a steel framed boat yeah. with wooden planks. Yeah. So you've got uh, steel which is expanding. Yeah. And, and the wood. wood that's contracting. Yeah. And as she sits in the sun each day, um, again with a dark painted hull, yeah, it's everything's normal. fighting each other. <clears throat> Well, that was pretty impressive, wasn't it? You don't Amazing, see yeah. that very often. No, and you, a boat like that tucked away, and you wouldn't yeah. know it was there because it's behind this shed. So. Yeah. Well, every yard's got one, isn't it? A project in the, in the corner. And this is a project. And this is a project, isn't it? It's yeah. a, apparently, it's a 12 metre. Yeah, well, it's got the lines and the shapes. Apparently, it's west wind. Okay. So we're told. I mean, it looks like a lot of work, doesn't it, Mike? But yeah, but fundamentally, the shape of the boat's still there. It's not sagging over its posts and, or anything like that. But, yeah, it's a hell of a project, I mean, but it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it is. Know, someone with the right amount of love and time and money. <laughs> a small version of the J, almost a weekend project. Well, yeah, in comparison, maybe, but uh, it is beautiful. It would be nice to see it sailing again. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure I'm even going to bother looking up. West Wind I don't think it's going to be in, in Bristol's Book no. of Sailing Cruises, really. It doesn't quite qualify. No. But I think we've sort of done it justice a bit. Thank you very much for joining me, Mike. It's been, been my absolute, pleasure. No, it's, it's been, been my, my pleasure. pleasure. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, good to know that we actually came from the same neck of the woods yeah. originally. Yeah, amazing. Have thought that? There we go. There's <laughs> lots of yarning to go on about what happened back, <laughs> back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, well, it's been good fun to do, and it has just proved once and for all that I wasn't a train spotter after all. Once again, and as always, thank you so much for watching. Thanks also for all the comments that continue to keep flooding in. Keep sending them, we love reading them. Make sure that you've subscribed. Make sure you've also ticked that bell icon to make sure that you get notified whenever we post up another video. In the meantime, stay safe, stay well. Until next time.